You know how to whistle, don't you, Steve? You just put your lips together and blow. blow, 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 blow. Prepare to be astonished. Hello and welcome to Headline This. How are you guys doing? This is a uh, special episode, a bonus episode, if you will, uh, for Headline This, where I'm going to be pulling uh, episodes from over and out um, and putting them into Headline This. This one's a merge of two episodes where I have conversations with Matt Fittus about his um, his fascination and obsession with the, the character Freddy Krueger and the Nightmare on Elm Street series. Uh, this is right off the back of uh, the Lee Thorne episode, so it's nice to be able to, um, to, to, to put this out there, to merge it all together as, uh, as, a, as, as a part of that entity. This first episode uh, that we're pulling over from over now was dated the uh, 2nd of November 2011 and um, concerns the, uh, the franchise, the horror film franchise in Nightmare on Elm Street. Let's go to that first. We're here to talk about uh, the Freddy Krueger films, the Nightmare and Elm Street yeah. series, and um, and yeah. But first of all, tell us who you are and where you actually are from, where you're actually hailing from right now. Okay, I'm I'm Matthew. I'm 34 years of age. I originally come from Boston. Yes. I've uh, been there for uh, 21 years, and then moved from there to Northampton, which um, which well, I've been living there for the past 14 years. Uh, married with a teenage stepson and a teenage daughter. Great. Sounds like uh, a, a busy little household you got going down there. That and the hamster as well. And the hamster as well, but... Uh... Well, it's well, it's, well, the hamster's not mine, it's my daughter's, but... Well. <laughs> so tell us about your uh, your first experience of of watching A Nightmare on Elm Street. Now, it, it, this actual interview that we're conducting now is actually on an anniversary, isn't that right? Yes. Yes, it is. It's the 27th anniversary of the original film's release in the U.S., um, okay. 2nd of November, 1984. Um, it played, I can't remember how many screens it originally played mm-hmm. at the time, but I remember one time it was posting that 55% of the market played. It had, it had taken well over $14.5 million, which uh, is pretty good going, considering that the budget of the film was $1.2 million. Very small. And... And the hard time that Robert Shea of New Line Cinema got to uh, gain the money together to make the film, which we'll go into at some point in this uh, in this interview, um, that in itself, if you pardon the pun, was a nightmare. But um, I'll say more on that later. But let's say for, um, for 1984, I mean, it's been a pretty low budget film. To uh, rake that amount of money in in that short amount of time was pretty good going, and the film actually went on to make over $26 million at the U.S. box office. Um, I don't know how much it took the rest of the world, but that in itself was quite a successful film at the time. Yeah, that's that's a, a, a staggering difference, and I think the horror genre has always been one of those genres where it's either been a hit or a miss. Well... To quote what Robert Englund once said in, 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 in an interview when he was promoting Freddy's Dead over here back in 1992, he said that the horror film itself is treated like um, the poor country cousin to the so-called A movie, you know, like the big blockbusters of today and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. In Europe, in the UK and the rest of the world, it's, it's, it's treated with a massive amount of respect. There are loads of fans out there, not just Freddy or Jason or Michael Myers, but I mean in horror 
in particular. Yeah. They have a deep respect for it. They can speak, um, you know, talk about horror with such intelligence. And it has it has changed over the over the uh, the decades. Um... Oh, it has. It definitely has. I mean, if if you look at the horror films from the 60s and the 70s, I mean, you had films like Psycho and Rosemary's Baby uh, in the 60s, like really big horror movies of, of that decade. You get into the 70s with films like The Exorcist and The Omen. I mean, The Exorcist in itself was a hugely successful film. I mean, it was it was big budget at the time, and a lot of the stuff that they actually did in that film, I mean, it, they, they spent months and months and months filming this you know, filming the adaptation of William Peter Platt's novel. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, it, it raked in the big bucks when it was released um, just after Christmas of 1973. And if you, if you um, inflation adjust the takings, it, I think the amount of money it took was just a little bit less than half the um, amount of money that Titanic took when that was released back in 1997. And then as you go later on into the 70s with films like Halloween, and then you go into the 80s with Friday the 13th, and now with A Nightmare on Elm Street, um, the horror genre has just changed dramatically. Sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. But Yeah, and I, I think a lot of that has has to do with the way that society treats it. I think to begin with, when when horrors started to get uh, reimagined in, in the in was it like uh, end of the nineties, I think, where yeah. they started to try and work more in terms of gritty realism and um, uh, to create a thick darkness. That uh, that and and it, it kind of it became a, a known thing that it had to be this raw grittiness that that everybody kind of like has to has to go into the cinema and actually endure it. Well, it's the best it's the best form of escapism you can get. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing more exhilarating than seeing loads of people sitting in a darkened cinema screening of a horror film and everybody screaming, jumping out of the seats at the same time at something that you, you probably think. Oh, you're going to predict that this is going to come, but when it hits you, it, it you know, it's like you've just walked into a war. You, it's unexpected. My first experience of watching a number in Elm Street, I was 13 years old. Uh-huh. And actually, the, the, the first film wasn't the first one that I'd watched. At the time, every, I think all, every kid who was under the age of 18 knew who Freddy Krueger was and was aware of these films. Yeah. And, you know, they, they probably sat downstairs and watched them if the parents brought them in, you know, brought them in from the video store to watch that night themselves, and they just sort of sneaked and watched a little bit of it and liked it so much that they wanted to watch it. That's right. That's easy. But for me, the very first um, video that I watched to do with Freddy was actually a couple of episodes of the TV series, Freddy's Nightmares. And then after I watched that, um, I went round to a friend's house and they had a copy of the fourth film, The Dream Master, so we sat and watched that. You sort of become hooked. I mean, I definitely was. I mean, um, one of the commemorative magazines that was there at the time, I think it was to do with the fifth film, The Dream Child. Um, I bought a copy of that and, of course, was familiar with the character of Freddy and also what went on in the film. A friend of mine... At the time when Sky Movies had only just started, when satellite TV was becoming the big thing in the sort of like, I think it was like late 80s, I think it was the beginning of 1990 mm-hmm. actually, um, a friend of mine actually recorded A Nightmare on the Street for me off of Sky Movies and I brought it home, uh, put it in the video, I was watching it with my mum and dad and that was it, I absolutely fell in love with it. You know, it, it, it's, it's basically stuck with me for the past past 21 years now. But uh, what, what can you tell me about the uh, the origin of a Nightmare on Elm Street? How did Wes Craven uh, come across this this idea of of children, uh, teenagers uh, dying in their sleep from a uh, well, it <laughs> it was all all from a series of newspaper articles. It was in the Los Angeles Times that Wes Craven um, came across these articles, and there was like a year and a half um, apart from each other. It was like three, well, the newspaper considered them to be unrelated, but Wes saw these three articles and he knew, he thought that there was a connection somewhere. Mm -hmm. And it was all to do with um, young um, 
Hmong men that, that have been in forced relocation camps. Um, they basically um, come out of there and moved to like America or whatever. It, it was basically the time of Pol Pot, the time of Cambodia and the Khmer Rouge and stuff like that. It was all within like the late 70s, the beginning of the early 80s. Uh -huh. And it was the third article that the Los Angeles Times had printed that really hit a nerve with um, with Wes Craven. Um, again, it was a young man who'd come out of forced relocation camps with his um, family. Um, his father was a doctor. And the son basically turned around to him and said, look, I'm afraid to fall asleep. I'm afraid there's something after me. And I'm afraid that if I fall asleep, I'll die. I won't wake up at all from this. And they did everything in their power in order mm -hmm. to get this, this kid to sleep, um, giving him warm milk, um, sleeping pills that his father demanded they take. His father was a doctor. Um, he gave him sleeping pills, but the, the, um, the kid didn't take them. He hid them in, under his pillow. And uh, he had a coffee pot um, percolator um, hidden in his room that he had connected up to a large extension cord, which he'd hidden behind curtains so it wouldn't be seen. And just one evening, when he was sitting up with his parents watching the TV, he fell asleep. Um, mm -hmm. Relieved by this, I thought, oh, he's actually fallen asleep now. They took him up to bed, put him into bed, put the covers over him, um, went downstairs, watched the rest of the movie. I think they went up to bed after it finished. And all of a sudden, just during the middle of the night, they heard screaming. Um, they rushed into his room, and the kid was just dead. Okay. Um, an, autop an autopsy revealed there was nothing wrong with the uh, with the boy, except that he, he just died in his sleep. And it all seemed to stem from the fact that it, it was probably something that he had actually dreamed about. Wow, and that's incredible. Once, now, and once Wes read about this, he thought, I've got to make a movie about this. Hence the creation of um, A Nightmare on Elm Street and the creation of um, Freddy Krueger. The idea of actually creating this, this character, I mean, um, with Freddy Krueger as we see him now, um, do you well, do you know if there was a process there, or was it just that's it? I know what I want. I want this guy with the hat, the glove, stripy top. Well, uh, um, with Freddy, a lot of it was all from Wes Craven's past. I mean, Fred. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the original film, he called Fred Krueger. Um, it's only from like the second film onwards that we all know him as Freddy Krueger, even though in the first film you do hear Nancy call him Freddy. Gotcha. Um but um, Fred was the name of a kid who used to bully Wes Craven quite a bit. He, I think he had the same paper route as him, and he used to bully him quite frequently. Um, Kruger is an extension of one of the characters that Wes Craven came up with for the film Last Hours of the Left. Um, it's an extension of Krug, um, the main villain from that film. Gotcha. Um, the hat was similar to a hat that, he, that was worn by um, a drunk who sort of frightened West once when he was a kid. Um, this drunk sensed that someone was watching him and he just turned around and gave him a really um, frightening stare and it just scared him ever since. Um, the jumper. Now, it's, um, not a lot of people will probably know this, but in the film, the jumper's red and green, but in the original screenplay, the jumper was actually red and yellow. Uh huh. Right. In the very first in the very first draft, which I've actually seen a copy of, um, it was just about this guy wearing a red and yellow sweater. But the reason it was changed to it being red and green was that Wes had read an article in a scientific magazine that the two colours, red and green, were difficult for the human eye to put side by side. So in a sense, that made that made it a bit unnerving. Gotcha. Um, yeah. And the, wep and the weapon of choice, the famous glove, um, he was going through all different sorts of weapons. What, should, what would this guy have? Would he have a knife? Would he have a sickle? Would he have, like a machete? Well, I'll say machete. He already had that with Jason in Brother the 13th. But um, you remember at the time he had a cat, and he saw the cat just retracting his claws or just doing something with his paw. And that was it. That was how the glove was born. And... I mean, you, you just show um, people just those three items, the hat, the jumper, and the glove, or just one of them, and they instantly they will turn around and say Freddy just like that because they are such recognisable 
pieces of his costume. And it's incredible that they're all elements that that were all separate in his mind. They all came at different times, different different inspirations. And yeah, I mean, it, it, that that's how it works. You you pull in all these yeah. different things, and you get something, and it and it is a unique image. I don't think it has ever been uh, recreated. A lot of the with the other characters we've mentioned, like Leatherface, um, Jason Voorhees, and even Michael Myers. Yeah. So they're all played by people that do not say a word in any of the films. They're basically like stuntmen or yeah, just lanky, um, strong, big build people that are going around. Silent killers, medicine. basically. They don't have to say anything. They don't have to. They only have to just turn up and and no. yeah, stab them. But what gives? <laughs> but what gives Freddy such an appeal is the fact that he has he has a personality. He has a character all of his own, and it's just brought to life brilliantly by Robert Englund. Yeah, and each and every time, it's never been anybody else. It's always been Robert Englund. Isn't that correct? Well, until the remake that came out last year, it, it had always been Robert. But um, he was the one that sort of brought the character to life. He sort of brought him to life off of the page once he read it. He really wanted this role. And um, I'll tell you a really good story about this. Um, the casting director of A Nightmare on the Street, Annette Benson, uh-huh. had worked on another film called National Lampoon's Class Reunion. And Robert Englund had actually gone for every single male part that was in that film, but didn't get anything. He got no role at all. Okay. And the casting director um, really felt sorry, but I think she sensed that there was something there. Cause he thought, she thought it was weird that he kept coming back for all these different roles, that there was something there that, was, that made her think, would he be suitable for a different kind of role? And when she was bringing people in for West to interview for A Nightmare on the Street, she phoned up Robert's agent, um, Joe Rice, and said, look, um, can you get someone down here, you know, to um, see West for this for this role? And they said, well, look, I can get him down to you sort of like ASAP. He said, good, get him down here now. And that was it. See, a, a, the rest is history, basically. A, a lot of films are actually rescued by good casting, and I think that uh, mm-hmm. the, the role of a casting director, uh, sorry, a casting agent, is is heavily under underrated, and so you, they don't realize that that all these all these actors and all these actresses who get these roles, who become perfect for the roles, uh, they're mm-hmm. they're actually brought in by these casting casting people and. Yeah, I mean that that sounded like one of those stories that it was, you know, her sheer uh, understanding of what was needed for the role. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, well, I mean, what to said that the casting of Freddy for the first film was a really big deal. Yeah. I mean, if if he made the wrong decision, I think the film would just have fallen flat on its face. Having Robert Englund playing Freddy in that film just made it gave the film more strength, and yeah. he played it with such evil. I mean, I think to quote what um, West said, he said that he came in with such piss and vinegar, and he really wanted the roles so badly that you know he he just that he, I mean Robert Englund is he's, he's really talkative. I mean, I've met him myself, and he's right. he's, he's the sort of person that you know he takes time out to speak to the fans. You know he. He's really down to earth, and he, he's 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 really with it. Um, I mean, once he starts talking, he's like a locomotive; he just doesn't stop. Um, but on that occasion, he just sat there, listened to what Wes had to say about the role, about the film in general, and that was it. And I think there was something there that Wes saw that thought to himself, "This is the guy for the role." Exactly. And see, so when when did you actually meet him? How many years ago was that? It was. Six years ago, we met him at um, Milton Keynes. Um, it was one of these big film and TV collector's fairs they have on. Uh-huh. And um, I wasn't aware of it at the time. But the day that we met him, um, it was actually on his wedding anniversary. Gotcha. It was on the 1st of October 2005. Um, we all went down there. I think I'd, was, I think I'd waited for something like four hours. And I was not disappointed at all. Right. To be a part of something for so long, but yet still still be able to give to the fans after all these years and, and still keep it oh, fresh. Oh, definitely, and definitely. He must, he must get the same questions over and over again, and I bet you he still answers them with the same vigor and, and, and intelligence. Well, he, he, you know? 
Yeah, I mean, he still has people come up to him dressed as Freddy and signing bits of Freddy memorabilia. I mean, yeah. he signed my um, poster that I got for Dream Warriors, yeah. the British film poster for Dream Warriors. Just expecting him to put his autograph on it. And he does a little caricature of himself on the poster as well, which I thought was really nice. That's really good. Yeah, because, I mean, well, before he took on the role of Freddy, I mean, he was famous for playing the role of Willy in the science fiction series V. Oh, right. In the early 80s, and, um, you know, in, I remember um, him saying at one time in his um, in his book that I've got, um, he said that he was there um, doing signings for V and the Willie character when Robert Shea came up to him and um, started talking about, you know, how successful the film is and everything and that. He was, he was obviously talking about a nightmare on Home Street, and he said, well, you should see the queues outside, you know, it, it's really big. And he says, yeah, I'm sure it is, Bob. I think all these people are here for me. And he says, nah, it's for nightmare. And when he looked, the queue had changed from sort of like these geeky, nerdy type of kids to um, kids that were dressed in like black leather, all punked out and everything like that. The, the heavy metal yeah. um, rock type of um, people. Hey, everybody. I'm sorry to just interrupt this interview, but we have a few words from our sponsors. You unlock this door with the click of a mouse. Beyond your screen lies another dimension. A dimension of paranormal events, conventions, and investigations. You're moving into a land of interviews, live chats, and prizes. You've just crossed into ReporterChicks.com. Reporter Chicks, bringing all your favorite haunted locations, events, and faces right to your computer. Join the Chicks, Charlie, Buffy, Danny, and Sarah Thursday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the hottest paranormal happenings from coast to coast. Only on ReporterChicks.com. Will Robert Englund be returning for the role, or is that it now? I think um, I think he's closed the door on the series for good. Gotcha. I mean, th- I mean, the franchise has basically been restarted now with the remake that came out last year. You've got a new actor playing Freddy in the form of Jackie Earl Haley, who loads of um, genre fans know as Rorschach from Watchmen. Now he did a pretty good job of the role, um, and I was quite impressed with how the remake was done. I mean, the um, I think it was like a couple of years before the film came out, I was saying to friends, I'm not going to see the remake because I know for a fact it's not going to have the same impact as it did then. And then when I heard that someone else was going to play Freddy, I thought, that's it, I'm not going to see it now. But then I saw the two trailers that were out, and I thought, well, it could be quite interesting. Mm-hmm. Put a new spin on it. And then I went to see it at the cinema last year, and I say I, I was I was quite impressed with the efforts that they did. Yeah. So, yeah, and I, I but, think um, when, when it comes along as a remake, you, you have to step back and say, okay, well, it, it's going to happen regardless of my liking or not liking of it. Uh, yeah, cause, I mean, at least you can do is watch it and see for yourself, and sometimes you're pleasantly surprised. Yeah, cause you, you look at the classic horror films that have been remade. I mean, Psycho, I've not seen the remake, no intention of seeing the remake. No. Um, of course, you have the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, that had been remade in 2003, and then they brought out like a prequel story, and then there's a new one that's coming out in 3D next year. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it was only a matter of time that um, until they got their hands on a Nightmare on Elm Street exactly. and do their own version of it. Exactly, because it, it's remake heaven out there at the moment in Hollywood, and I think that they're they've found a nice safe haven in there uh, to just keep on re- regurgitating stuff that's already been successful. Um, I think it's probably because Hollywood's run out of ideas. I think they've run out of ideas, and also I think they're they're tightening their belts. I mean, they're they're, they're being uh, same with the music industry. They're being hit by so many uh, obstacles, such as piracy and uh, and illegal, illegal copying, that uh, they're they're constantly in fear and only focusing on the money um, and what can actually be a money spinner. Music these days, yeah. I don't think you can get anywhere without actually finding a song that is just designed to make money. 
Um, so unfortunately, it, that that's how it is, and I think that you can probably find nowadays with people having their own video cameras at home and uh, a lot more independent teams uh, of of amateurs are actually going out there and 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 working some pretty incredible and in, original stuff. So, oh yeah, that's true. But as long as they sort of take their influences as what's from out there now, yes, and try and think, try and sort of like create their own version of it without sort of plagiarising what's there already. Exactly. Well, I was going to say about the, um, in, in the terms of um, how, they, um, how they got the money together to make the films. Of I mean, course. at the time, um, New Line Cinema um, were basically a, a distribution company. They were a 16mm distribution company um, based in um, Lower Manhattan, New York, um, long before they moved to Los Angeles and Hollywood. And, it was basically run by two people, Robert Shea, mm-hmm. who's like the, the chairman and the founder of the company, and Sarah, um, Sarah Risha, who was the co-producer of the first film. And um, when the script for Nightmare came to him, he was really taken by it, and he really wanted to make this film. The only problem was he didn't have any uh-huh. money at the time to put in to, you know, to put in as part of, you know, for the budget was concerned. Yes. Yeah. So he had to get money from outside sources. I think he even had to. I think he even borrowed money from friends and family as well. But he was looking for the real major investor, and one of the companies involved with the film, Smartic Pictures, were going to invest a million dollars into the film. They were going to advance him a million dollars to put into the production. So I think like a few days later, after they just turned around and said oh, they, they were going to drop out of it, so Robert was back to square one. And um, Rich remembered one time he said that when he looked at Robert Shea's fingers, his fingernails, he could see that he was really digging into them and they were really bloody. And I think it dawned on him then the actual stress and strain of actually getting money together to make a film. Um, But he managed to get it in the end. He uh, made a deal with a major home video um, distribution company in America called Media Home Entertainment. And a guy called Joseph Wolf, he was one of the executive executive producers on A Nightmare on the Street. Uh-huh, yeah. And he said, look, you can take over the whole film if I can't get my commitment together the next three or four weeks. He then managed to go back to the guy who ran Smart Eight Pictures and, money, and browbeat him into putting forward the last remaining few hundred thousand dollars. Gotcha. And um, got the film made. But he just hated the process of getting that together in order to, you know, get the film made. And it nearly didn't get made. It nearly, it nearly didn't even get shown into the cinemas. Because um, the company, the lab that was processing the negatives at the time to get the films out to the cinema, uh-huh. get the, the actual film reels out to the, the um, film theatres in America to play them, um, they turned around and said, you're not going to have the prints unless we get paid. And again, there he had to. He managed to find a way of. He actually made a deal with the lab that was processing the um, the prints in order for the films to be shown onto the screen. And mm-hmm. he did a good job that he did. Or else, you know, we wouldn't be sitting here now. There wouldn't be loads of people uh, around the world, um, you know, watching these movies, talking about them, um, you know, for the past 27 years. So it's a true testament to him getting it out there because he believed in it so much. Um, He believed in West so much in in, in that story. Mm But, you know, not to have it made or not even to get it on the the cinema screen would have been a tragedy in itself. Absolutely. And uh, I I think I myself have kind of, um, from talking to you, got a a newfound respect for the series because I I, I must admit I I, I probably watched it the least out of all the the, uh, horror series and I, I I don't think I've seen that many of the sequels um, so it's certainly something that I'm going to uh, pick up and uh, take a look at uh, one by well, one. It's surprising, it's surprising the number of people that I've spoken to as well, um, in fact one of the people that I work with, he's not even seen one I mean as, as I say, these films have been out there now for like I say for the past 27 years yeah. Yeah. And it's amazing how many people have not actually sat down and watched one. I mean, they, they've been on the TV, um, goodness knows how many times. They're available to buy in the shops. I mean, the, the first seven films have now finally come out on Blu-ray mm-hmm. in a box set. So, you know, 
people can now watch them in glorious high definition. So the picture and the sound quality is going to be absolutely fantastic. It needs to come to them in their dreams, maybe. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> That's probably why. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it is one of those movies that, um, because you you always hear about Halloween around Halloween time because Halloween is Halloween. Friday the 13th, there's, yeah. there's uh, several of those uh, every year, Friday the 13th. But, uh, yeah. you know, I, I think Nightmare on Elm Street doesn't actually have its own holiday or a place in the year. Uh, usually Halloween kind of picks it up somewhere and uh, and people, of course, get into the get up. But, I think well, it's funny you say that. Actually, because twenty, yeah, because twenty years ago, mm-hmm. um, uh, the day before Freddy's Dead: The Final Nightmare was released in the states, mm-hmm. um, it was released on. You got to believe this date here, Friday the thirteenth of September, nineteen ninety one. Yeah. Um, the day before it was actually declared Freddy Krueger Day in Los Angeles. Gotcha. Because the whole because like the series was meant to be coming to an end after being around for seven years, um, that they that they, they sort of had, well, it wasn't actually considered like a national holiday, but it was an entire day devoted to this popular character, this now popular horror icon that had been, you know, around during like the latter half of the 1980s and mm-hmm. the beginning of the next decade, the 1990s. Yeah. Um, of course, like the first five films, um, plus two seasons of the TV series Freddy's Nightmares, before Freddy's Dead came out, um, that they they did like a massive celebration, and uh, again, it just shows how much love and respect the fans have got for these films and for that exactly. character. Exactly, and and I think it. Uh... Uh, whatever happens in the future, you know, they, they will still have that fan following, and at least, you know, the the movies will forever be immortalized on on whatever disc is available to buy them on. So uh, that's at oh, least yeah. the thing. At least it's out there. Um, yeah. It's not. I'm I'm just hoping that in a few years' time, um, well, they say in three years' time, because um, in 2014 it's going to be the film's 30th anniversary. They have one really massive celebration. Yes. Have all the films being shown in the cinema on the big well, where they should be on the big screen. That For me, be it would be an absolute dream because I would love to see the original film on the big screen and actually, in, you know, sit in the dark room with loads of other people experiencing it. A, a real fan experience, um, yeah, like 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 they did for Star definitely. Wars. Just have a complete yeah. marathon. Uh, yeah, uh, well, to be honest, I mean, I I think you're in a position now where the the social networking uh, doors are, are wide open. I think the more people who actually voice that, the the the, the most likely it's going to happen. So, yeah, let them give in to the social network peer pressure. I say. Yeah, that that's the only <laughs> way forward now. That's the that's the way it always goes. So yeah, I I I think in in three years time we can always if we're still doing a a podcast whatever we're going to be doing. Um, Maybe we can also pick up the uh, the call again and uh, and have oh, our yeah. own celebration through podcast. Yeah, by my, by which time my hair has probably got more grey and I've probably lost a few more brain cells. Yeah, you never know. I might have, I might have, a, I might have a, something screaming in another room, other than my wife. <laughs> Bless her. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for uh, for joining me for this uh, for this interview. It's uh, it's. That's, like. that's not a problem. Thank, thank you for inviting me. Uh, and is there, uh, before I sign off, is there anywhere that uh, you can, uh, you'd can, you like people to go um, to find out more information about yourself or the Freddy uh, franchise? Uh, well, there is one website that I've been on quite a bit. And uh-huh. it, it is a fantastic site, and it's actually run by another one of my friends on Facebook. Her name is uh, Deandra. Um, she's got her own um um, Facebook account as a cosplayer. She goes under the um, moniker of Nancy Thompson of Elm Street. Uh huh. Um, and I see, you, you see a picture of her, and you think you're actually looking at the actual Nancy from the first film. Gotcha. She's got she's got it. She's got the roles down to an absolute T. Wow. Um, but she she moderates a site which is um, www.nightmareonelmstreetfilms.com. Gotcha. And it's a fantastic site. There's loads of pictures from the movies. There's um, stuff like on the press kit. You've got deleted scenes on there, um, behind-the-scenes photographs. 
even posters from each of the films from around the world, uh, as well as um, stuff to do with the TV series. Um, the downloads, it's like you can download the trailers or even TV spots, mm-hmm. um, even other like different trailers from America to do with the films as well. It, it's a fantastic site and really worth actually looking at. Great. Okay, um, that, that sounds like a good uh, yeah. a good link. And one more as well. Um, another friend of mine on Facebook, um, funny enough, was actually in one of the On Street movies. Uh, mm-hmm. Leslie Dean, she played Tracy in Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. Um, now, if any of your listeners are uh, massive music fans, uh, let me point you in the direction of Scary Cherry and the Bang Bangs. Now, I was pointed in their direction by Leslie herself. She's the actual lead singer, and she goes under the uh, pseudonym of uh, Scary Cherry. Well, that's Scary Cherry and the Bang Bangs, right? Scary Cherry and the Bang Bangs, yeah. Um, They've got an an EP that you can get on iTunes, as well as um, a single on on there as well. The, the, The single's called Cherry Bomb, and the limited edition EP is just called Scary Cherry and the Bang Bangs. There's five songs on there. And they're all written by people in the band, and it's a, it, it's well worth listening to. She's got a really unique voice. I think I remember posting on Facebook one time that she sounds a little bit like Debbie Harry from Blondie. Nice. Ah, so she she does have a, a reach back to the those uh, that kind of uh, punk rock. Yeah, well, she, yeah. But a lot of her influences, well, the band's influences, are people like um, Iggy Pop and Alice Cooper. Gotcha. Uh, as well as a few other things as well, but they have got their own unique sound, and it is it is really really good. I do recommend it. Yeah, so you heard it, guys. You've got uh, the Nightmare on Elm Street um, film website. Um, there'll be links on the website as well for that. Um, I'm sure you can find Matt Fittis on um, on Facebook. I'm sure I'll be more than happy to uh, to have you follow him. Uh, <laughs> Unless I follow you. Unless, unless he follows you first. <laughs> and uh, there, and there is a there is a big community out there for the for the Nightmare on Elm Street films, and I'm sure that uh, Matt also contributes to those as well. And uh, oh, yeah. of course, yep. Yeah, don't forget to check out. Uh, I've forgotten her name already. Cherry and the Bang Bangs. Gary Cherry and the Bang Bangs. And don't forget... You'll find, them on face, they'll find them on Facebook as well. Don't forget to check out Scary Cherry and the Bang Bangs. Um, so there we have it, folks. That's Matt Fittis, and that is A Nightmare on Elm Street. And uh, I hope you all sleep well to this one. Thank you very much Sweet for uh, calling in. <laughs> This is Matt Fittis' return to have a definitive talk on A Nightmare on Elm Street and give the lowdown on cosplay um, as well as the Winter London Comic Con 2014 event. So this is, uh, this is of course, old stuff. This is uh, the most recent event. Um, so, so strap in and listen to the second part of Matt Fittis, the UK Freddy Krueger cosplayer. Before we get to the interview with Matthew Fittis, our guest for today, uh, I would like to tell you about Marnie Creations. Marnie Creations is in its third year making all kinds of jewelry, from dress, vintage, to gift ideas ranging from beaded bookmarks, keyrings, bottle cluster charms. That is something that you ought to have a look at. You can adorn any gift bottle with what looks to be like a gorgeous cluster of grapes draped down from the bottleneck. It makes every bottle look worthy of a centerpiece. A fantastic gift idea. What else? Oh yeah, Christmas decorations. Personalized wooden hanging tree decorations beaded to your specific requirements. If little Bobby wants to have his own tree decoration, he can have one. It's fantastic. You you just can't beat that. Naturally, this is radio, so it's impossible to show you from this vantage point, which is why you need to take a look at yourself. Oh, hang on. <laughs> Let me try again. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Let's go with that. I want you to go and take a look at yourself in the mirror right now and tell yourself 
that you need to go to MarnieCreations.com and also be a part of the buzz and the community on the Facebook page. That's Marnie Creations, M-A-R-N-I-E, Creations. Oh, and by the way, Catherine is working on her last creations of the year, and there is a deadline for Christmas. The last orders for Christmas will be November the 1st. Why so early, I hear you say? Well, Catherine and I are expecting a baby. She's carrying our firstborn, who will be making an appearance into the world early December. How incredible is that? How unbelievably magical and amazing is that? And I tell you what, we're ready. We have absolutely everything ready. We're all sorted. But Catherine wants to make sure that you also have everything that you need for the holiday season. I've got to say, she is prolific. Catherine is skilled and she loves to find new ways to make people happy with the things that she creates. So remember, November the 1st, folks. Last orders for Marnie Creations. MarnieCreations.com Well, we've got Matt Fetters back on the show. This will be his third time. Matt is a mega fan and dedicated follower of a Nightmare on Elm Street series with particular focus on uh, the larger-than-life prolific dream stalker, Freddy Krueger. I had to read that. Could you tell? <laughs> Should I say that again? Would it sound better if I said it the second time? Second time's always better than the first, right? Okay, Matt is a mega fan and dedicated follower of the Nightmare on Elm Street series, with particular focus on the larger-than-life and prolific dream stalker Freddy Krueger. That sounded better. That was so much better. I know what you're thinking and saying to yourself, we've been here before, but I've, as I mentioned, um, I want to give Matt a chance to be heard with the best sound quality available at the no-budget end that we're working with. Out of all the shows that we've done before, the conversation with Matt Fittis was plagued with technical difficulties. So think of this as a reboot. And also we're going to talk about cosplay. Now I'm new to the idea of cosplay. I'm not really a cosplayer. Um, through, through several friends, however, Matt, who is probably one of the most frightening and convincing Freddies you'll ever meet, it's fantastic. It really is a transformation that is worth looking at. You know, it, it's an incredible thing that they do at these uh, conventions. And having gone to um, Comic Con last year, um, uh, yeah, I, I, th I think I'm warming to the idea. But it, it, if I did go to a convention, and if I did happen to get involved in cosplay, what would be my thing? Who knows? Anyway, this is Matt Fittis, finally coming from a place of good sound quality. Let's see how this one goes, folks. Enjoy the interview. The kids of Elm Street don't know it yet, but something is coming to get them. Nightmare on Elm Street. No! No! She's the only one who can stop it. If she fails, no one will survive. Help me, please! Wes Craven's Nightmare on Elm Street, rated R. It's hard to believe it's coming up to three years since we did the, the very first podcast. That was 2011. Um, yeah, and yeah. there again we were talking about um, a nightmare on Elm Street. Cause at that time it was 27 years to the day that it was released. Now it's coming up to what is considered to be a really big milestone for the series. It's going to be 30 years old next month. There's, there's been lots of um, events of, sort of like around near enough that time. Mm -hmm. um, I know that Robert Englund made his very final appearance in the Freddy makeup in August of this year in, at a horror convention in Chicago. Much to the, the delight of the fans over there. And the makeup looked absolutely fantastic. And to actually see him there uh -huh. um, in the photos, in the makeup, for the very last time, it, it was quite emotional for the fans. Because they, they've all been saying, oh, we'd like to see him in the role of Freddy again. We'd like to see him do one more movie. Mm -hmm. As much as he would like to do it, and he has admitted he has one more film in him, he's now not at the right age. You know, he's in yeah. his late He's 67 now, and to really? go, yeah, and to go to film each day and having to put the makeup on each day would be taking too much of a toll on him now. So for him to make one very final appearance 
for the fans in Chicago, August just gone, uh-huh. in the Freddy Makeup, which was designed by Robert Kurtzman, who worked on a couple of the Freddy movies, um, was pretty much, a, 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 to pardon the uh, analogy here, a dream come true for the Nightmare fans. When it comes to the films itself, uh, there's only so much you can really do, I think. Um, I mean, uh, well, it, it's... It's more the case of coming up with fresh ideas. I mean, I think yeah. they pretty much exhausted every idea that they had when they when they made Freddy Said the Final Nightmare in 1991. Um, basically, it was a film where they thought, we'll just throw all the ideas in that the fans would probably like to see, like, you know, what would Freddy's um, dad be like, or, you know, did he have a family, which they showed in, like, flashbacks and everything, um, which sort of... Um, Ended the series in a way that you thought to yourself, well, this, I mean, hence the title, The Final Nightmare at the end of it. Yeah. Um, but then, of course, you had Wes Craven's New Nightmare come three years after. With that, that fresh is, new angle, completely yeah, different. But yeah, but that was a standalone movie, in my opinion, and also mm. a very clever take on the whole Nightmare series. The Serpent and the Rainbow. The people under the stairs. Last house on the left. A nightmare on Elm Street. Wes Craven, the master of horror, returns at last with a frightening new twist on terror. (laughs) Wes Craven's new nightmare, rated R, starts Friday, October 14th. This one was so... Cleverly well done and well thought up by Wes Craven um, in a way to bring Freddy back by having him invade the dreams and stalking the people involved in the making of his films. Yes. Um, Because basically the line that Wes says in the film is saying, like, you know, now that the films have ended, the genie's out of the the bottle. Yeah, exactly. What he's doing is he's invading the real world as an ancient demon who has gotten so used to being in the form of Freddy that you know, he, he, he's taking on that persona. It's, it's taken, it, it took it to another level, and I think that with uh, yeah. Wes Craven's uh, ability to think outside the box, he was in a very good place back in, was it 1994? He started writing the script, I think it was late 92, early 93. Right. They started filming it uh, towards the back end of 93 and finished up doing whatever bits he needed to do at the beginning of 94, ready for an October release of that year. And then, um, and then two, enough, two years later, he made Scream, so... Well, yeah, they, it, a lot of the fans have said that New Nightmare is a precursor to the Scream films. Yes. And a lot of them have said that if Wes Craven's New Nightmare hadn't been made, we wouldn't have Scream. Or maybe if it wasn't successful as it was, it probably wouldn't have been uh, Well, the box office for that was actually pretty lukewarm. It only made, on its release, $18 million. Mm-hmm. But it got such an appeal once it was released on DVD that it has become a really firm, you know, a really strong favourite among, amongst the fans. I mean, it's yeah, a film that yeah. I have championed on many occasions on Facebook. Um, which leads me to a rather interesting story on how I acquired the Freddy Glove, which I've now got. Mm -hmm. I was looking through some um, posts in one of the groups to do with Freddy on Facebook, which I belong to, and there was a girl on there who turned around and said that Wes Craven's new nightmare is a spoof of the first film. Now, when I read that, I just fumed, because I thought, no, this girl does not know what the hell she's talking about. I know for a fact it's not a spoof. I sort of laid into her and said, it's not a spoof. You don't even know what the meaning of the word spoof is. No, no, no. I would say, uh, yes, it is, and I was saying, you know, the reasons why and that sort of thing. And a lot of my other Facebook friends had seen this argument started joining in, defending me, up to the point where someone was saying, you don't want to mess with him, he knows his Elm Street. To a couple of minutes after, and I get an inbox message from one of my friends over in America, saying, you know, that he'd seen the seen the argument, seen how passionate I was 
in regards to filming with the series and that sort of thing. He then turned around to me and said that he was going to be building my very own Freddy Glove for nothing. <laughs> now, considering these guys build these gloves and sell them online, especially on eBay and that, they, they, they do go for quite a lot of money. Yes, yes. Me to get one um, for nothing, I thought, I, I was, I felt honoured. Yeah, well, if if you conduct yourself with decorum and passion and and not, you know, for the sake of actually, I mean, so that's, that's probably the first internet argument where somebody's actually gotten something out of it. Well, yes. <laughs> that's incredible. That's an incredible story. Yeah. But to, to spoof, I mean, uh, I don't think I've ever actually seen a spoof of Nightmare on Elm Street. No, there never has been one. Though. No. Um, I mean, there have been references to Freddy and the Nightmare on Elm Street in movies in the past. Yeah. I mean, Dragnet, the scene where um, Tom Hanks' character arrives at um, Dan Aykroyd's character's um, granny's house. Yeah. And he turns around and says, I knew it. It's Nightmare on Elm Street. That must make him Freddy Krueger. So it, it's become part of the popular culture, and to have it yeah. to be mentioned in films and even in other aspects, um, Ronald Reagan, um, back in the late 80s, in a speech, um, made a reference to A Nightmare on Elm Street um, by saying something along the lines of, of um, if you take a walk down our position's memory lane, it begins to look like Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> And and that's a bizarre um, reference, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even Bollywood's um, done its own version. Uh-huh. Uh, it's a film called uh, Mahakal. Right. Which I think literally means uh, monster. And it is basically um, a Bollywood version of A Nightmare on the Street. There's a person in there with a hideously disfigured face and he wears a, a glove on his hand with knives at the end of his fingers. Uh-huh. So it... it so it's embraced itself amongst popular culture for the past 30 years. But not to the point where it's actually been mocked or mimicked in that spoof fashion. It's never actually gone into that zone of no, genre. It has. And Which, I, don't, I don't think yeah. it ever will. That's one, one area where I'm actually quite thankful that no one has actually decided to do a parody of it or to actually... Um, yeah. You know, take like the naked gun approach or the mm. airplane approach, that sort of thing, and actually do something along those lines. So I'm actually quite thankful they've not done something like that. I was uh, watching uh, something the other day. I think it was um, pre rec from Red Letter Media. They were reviewing Alien Isolation, the game. Oh, that's the new uh, video game that's out. That's correct. And what they were saying, kind of, they said something that struck a chord and it, it kind of made me look at everything that um, that is a part of a franchise such as Freddy Krueger um, such as the Predator films the Alien films and what yeah. they said was is that when you watch the first film you're scared there's a fear because your your fear is is coming from an unknown place yeah so once you've actually gone past that and you kind of go into an area of nostalgia, you no longer have a fear, you're just looking forward to seeing the character. So when they started playing the Alien Isolation game, uh, as soon as the alien appeared, they went, oh look, there's the alien. It, it's all animated and everything, and it looks great. Wow, you know? And that was their response. It wasn't, oh my gosh, there's an alien, I'm scared. Because you cannot be afraid when you're looking at something with a sense of nostalgia. No. That's true. And it's, it's always, always the common thing, especially in, in horror movies, where, um, you know, that you have to face your fear. And once you have faced your fear and overcome it, then you can pretty much conquer anything. That's right. The way I, um, way I see it. And I think it's pretty much the way that Wes Craven saw it when he first came up with the concept of Freddy and A Nightmare on the Street. And it's even the same with a lot of the horror films he's done in the past. Um, like Last House on the Left, The Hills of Eyes, um, Deadly Friends, Serving the Rainbow, that sort of thing, um, where you have to face your own fears in order to overcome them. That's it. And that's pretty much, especially in the case with Nancy. I mean, 
she went from being sort of like a, you know, like it was like a mild mannered, um, goody two shoes teenager to uh, becoming a real badass um, girl at the end by booby trap, booby trapping the house and pretty much vanquishing Freddy yeah. at the end of the first film. And she's basically seen as the ultimate warrior when it comes to fighting Freddy in the in the films. She was the first to face and the first to defeat him. And everybody sort of looks on that as being the ultimate opposition for Freddy. Exactly. And it's not about uh, going in with, with a full arsenal of weapons or uh, ability oh, no, it and it. knowledge. It, it, it's it's just about getting used to the familiarity, uh, getting used to that fear and overcoming it. Who are you? I'm your nightmare. A nightmare on Elm Street. I, I think the last time we spoke, the, uh, the remake was just coming out or had already been out. I'm not too sure. Yeah, the remake had actually been out for at least, I think it was 18 months when we first Check. spoke about the series. Uh, well, there had been rumours that they were meant to be doing a second film, but uh, um, Brad Fuller of Platinum Dunes, um, which is Michael Bay's other company, which is basically um, a company that can do films on a, almost like a shoestring budget, mm -hmm. um, but um, still sort of like look really good. Um, he basically said that there weren't any plans to try and do um, a sequel to the 2010 version of Nightmare. Right. Um, of course, that that would that could possibly change. Who knows? Do you feel as though that the remake is a part of the the other Freddy films, or it, does it begin and end with Robert Englund? That's pretty much a question what all of the other Nightmare fans have been asked in the past. Mm -hmm. And the way I see it is this. The Nightmare film that Robert did is its own franchise in its own right. Yes. You've got seven films that have been around for, up to that point, set, um, you know, the first ten years, from 84 to 94. Then, of course, you have Freddy vs. Jason, which made its appearance in 2003. Now, that film was ten years in the making. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I think it's even... He, I mean, even turned probably turned around and say to be like 15 years in the making because at the time Paramount owned the right to do Friday the 13th and of course the Nightmare on Elm Street those films were housed at um, New Line Cinema gotcha yeah which was the which a lot of people have called and even still to to this day the house that Freddie built yeah so the big question is I mean you mentioned Freddie versus Jason yes now that was that's, that's taking two completely different fandoms and bringing them into one. Was that an idea that was rejected by the fans before the film came out, or was it uh, embraced? No, 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 no. It, it, in fact, um, during, through, throughout the uh, the whole convention circuit leading up to um, Freddy vs. Jason, um, Robert England had always been um, asked by fans, he's like... Um, do you think Freddy could kick Jason's ass and that sort of thing? Freddy's coming back. To spread his fear and regain his power to Freddy, he turns to an unspeakable evil. Wake, Wake up, Jason. Mommy wants you to make them remember what fear tastes like. Now that evil, Freddy, you is Jason, is turning on him. What a woman versus Jason, rated R. There had been so many ideas floating around as to what, um, what Freddy versus what the what the like Freddy versus Jason would be, and I think it was like seventeen or eighteen scripts that were floating around Hollywood at the time, and a lot of them were like um, retreads of an idea. Um, of like a, a cult following called the Fredheads, um, right. that were sort of um, looking into trying to bring Freddy back somehow, and I don't really know like the ins and outs of what were actually being put in the scripts, that sort of thing. But that was one sort 
sort of like main idea that was being used and floated around at the time. I think it must have been about 10 or 11 scripts that had that idea sort of mm-hmm. floating around and that sort of thing. She had uh, Peter Briggs, who um, came up with the idea for, I think it was the Alien vs. Predator, the, the graphic novel or whatever it was at the time. It wasn't the film that he came up with the idea with. I think it was, it was the graphic novel storyline that he came out with mm-hmm. around about that time. So, uh, and Ronald Moore and Brandon Braga, who were mainly part of the Star Trek universe, they, you know, they were involved especially with Star Trek The Next Generation at the time. They had even come up with an idea. Um, and, Fair enough. <laughs> and, 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 and a lot of them weren't actually that good. Um, and it needed to have a script. They needed to have ideas which were faithful to both the Nightmare mythology and the Jason mythology. And the script that was eventually um, accepted and then filmed was one that I would consider to be the one that fans were really pleased with. That that does surprise me, yeah. Yeah, and Mm. and the film I thought was really, really good, really, really clever, really thought out. Um, I mean, one of the things that Robert always wanted to see was what was like inside Jason's head. You know, what would Freddie, you know, what would Freddie be like in Jason's nightmares, that sort of thing. You can actually see that sort of happen in the film and he's really, really clever, really thought out. And the fight at the end, I mean, even to this day, in my mind, there is no real winner at the end of that movie. Freddie doesn't win, Jason doesn't win. There's, there's, there's no outright winner. Well, that, that's kind of satisfying in a way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because there was meant to be one idea poking around. I think it was about in the year 2000 where there were supposed to be two different endings. Right. And basically, whichever version of the film you saw would have a completely different ending to someone say, someone say, oh, Freddie won, and they'd say, oh, no, he didn't, Jason won. They would have that's tagged, on, that's... Which, uh, yeah, they would have tagged yeah. on whichever ending they would have wanted to put on so like the fans would have seen like a completely different film at the end as opposed to what other what the other fans have probably seen. So that would have been rather, rather interesting. But that that's yeah. the that's the future handled. Um we know that Robert Englund is no longer going to to go ahead with, with doing the Freddy Krueger thing. And at least the conventions are still gonna go ahead and, and cosplay is still going strong. That's oh, definitely. Well, the, the cosplay circuit, um, especially in America, mm-hmm. and a lot of the horror conventions, obviously you see people there dressing up as Freddy. I, I'm friends with um, quite a few cosplayers over in America. Um, yes. There's one person who does a really good Freddy over there. Um, there's the girl who does Nancy, which I mentioned about in the last podcast that we did to do with Freddy. Um, uh-huh. Deandra, her name was. She still does the convention circuit. Um, she doesn't do Nancy as much as she's done in the past because she's ventured into doing other um, cosplays like I think it's like Once Upon a Time and other ones like that. Yeah. But obviously Nancy is still going to be one that she's it, she's not going to jack that in. And no. there's a, another girl who I'm friends with called Taylor Bursky who goes around as Alice, who was the girl who um, vanquished Freddy in both um, Nightmare Four and Nightmare Five. Gotcha, gotcha. And, um, and she's pretty good as as her, and she's also done other cosplays. I mean, she's ventured into doing Buffy. Uh huh. That now, so. Um, so is, is there kind of an etiquette when it comes to doing cosplay? I mean, if you are all, uh, I, I take it all Freddy fans kind of talk to each other. That they're, they're very aware of each other. So. Oh, you... we are. We are. I mean, depending on mm-hmm. the things that people like, I mean, like Star Wars, Star Trek, Doctor Who, and that sort of thing, yeah. you're always going to have those people sort of like being like a close-knit community with each other. Yes. But I think the only difference with the the Nightmare community, and especially the people that cosplay Freddy and even some of the other characters from the Nightmare films, like the, the ones I've mentioned about already, yeah. Yeah. is that there is not the bitchiness and the bullying that tends to go around in a lot of the other cosplay circuits and the likes of Doctor Who and Star Wars and Star Trek and that sort of thing. 
it's almost like they seem to be going at each other's throats and it's almost like a war with them and it's not on. Mm, that, that, that doesn't seem right. Uh, no, yeah. it doesn't. Which is why I always feel, especially when I've befriended um, people on Facebook that like the Freddy movies and that yeah. sort of thing, and I always turn around and say to them and say, we Freddy fans look after our own. Following covered now from Saturday. Yes, it was the Winter Olympics, wasn't it? No, no, no. <laughs> winter Olympics. The film. The, 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 it's, it's the Winter Film. Winter, winter London Film and Comic Con. Olympics. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you you came in first with your your uh, <laughs> your, your killing spree with your hand of of. Um, the glove of love. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> is that is that your um? That's the same costume that you've used for quite a few conventions now, isn't it? Yeah. Well, since May of last year, when I first started um, cosplaying as Freddy. I'm determined that next year at Manchester Comic Con that I'm actually going to wear something. I don't I don't know what my fandom is really, but uh, they seem to be very heavy, very heavy on the uh, the fantasy. Role play, yeah. Um, yeah. that one, but it's a uh, whole lot of fun. It's a whole lot of fun, yeah. and it 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 helps. I mean, if, if it's a character that you really like, or it's a mm. um, particular um, aspect of whichever, like you know, fandom it is or that sort of thing, yeah. um, that you really like, you you get really immersed in it. I mean, yeah. with me especially, once once I put on the mask and the hat and the glove and that sort of thing, I sort of instantly become Freddy. In a good you know, way, no, in a yeah, safe I mean, way. <laughs> in fact, that is put to one side, Freddy is in the forefront. Gotcha. You know, when I go around, I try and walk like him. Um, I try and um, get the mannerisms right. There are even um, been occasions where where I have unnerved them to the point, you know, unnerved them by doing the laugh. I have actually, um, sorry, that's my daughter in the background. Um, I've, I've, I have actually done the laugh re- to the point where they, uh, where, why one girl, well, the first time I did it, which was in Milton Keynes in May last year, she had, she actually ran off. <laughs> thought it was that frightening. It was actually that frightening. And I thought, this is definitely a winner. You've got it. I mean, this is, yeah. it's like a second skin. Because you've also said that you're not going to be Freddy for much longer. <laughs> uh, no, let me just let me just clarify that. Well, um, when clarity. I put that post up on Facebook, yeah. um, I hadn't actually made it clear to people that it, that um, Saturday just gone was the first of four final appearances as Freddy for this year. For this year. For this year. So he's n- he's not going away in the trunk yet. No. Okay. No, Freddie. W- uh, my appearances of Freddie are still going to be going ahead into next year. Right. But I am restricting doing it in the summer because when I was at um, the summer um, Comic Con in London, that was such a scorching day. Yes. Yeah. yeah it's, it's almost like being in your own sauna. Yeah. Up. I mean, it was like 25, 26 degrees outside, <laughs> and the place was packed as it was already because they had such a high-profile guest in the form of Stan Lee yeah. at, um, at the event in July, and it was absolutely busy. In the first two hours in Earl's Court 2, the place was ramming. Gotcha. It was absolutely ramming. So, well, so what would you be uh, in, in the summer? I, I'm guessing, uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to have, shall I guess? You can guess if you want. It's going to be James Bond, right? Well, he's making his debut in Melbourne Keynes next month. I'm doing both days of Collector Mania, which has been going on for so many years in Milton Keynes now. Um, Freddie is making his penultimate appearance there on the Saturday, and then I'm debuting my Bond cosplay on the Sunday. Well, yeah. I think we've covered a lot. There's one question I do have to ask, and I've just seen the yes. picture on your um, on your Facebook page. Yeah. Um, you lost your hat, and you were <laughs> trying to pick it up with a selfie stick. Is that right? Oh, yeah. that was funny. Um, so, did you, did you get it back? We, it was while we were queuing up Saturday morning to go into Old Court uh-huh. 2. 
Gotcha. And I had just put my mask and hat on, I think it was about quarter to eight in the morning. And I didn't even feel the, the wind, but then I, I soon felt that, that something wasn't there. And then I noticed that the hat, that my hat had blown off. <laughs> and we were told, oh, Dolph Freddy's hat blown off. And it had blown onto the net that was above the car park. Oh, that was lucky. Well, yeah, but I was thinking, how the hell am I going to get my hat back? And I was thinking, someone says, has someone got anything that he can use? And there was a person there who had actually taken a, a little bit of a video of um, the queue outside while we were there lining up. You see, you borrow this if you want. So I got hold of the stick and grabbed the hat as much as I could, got it to the wall and sort of like dragged it up the wall to get it back up again. And there was about five or six people actually taking photos. I think it was their highlight of the morning. Anyway, and anyway, I'm going to do a shameless plug now. Yeah, okay. I think we're, we're, we're about time to wrap up, so you you, you do your plug. You, yes, now you've, you've, you've seen my um, my um, page on Facebook, not my profile, but my page, which is actually linked to my profile. Um, I only set this up, I think it was the February or March of this year. Um, uh huh. I mean, it is, it is. I mean, it's my name at the start, but then it's followed by the UK Freddy Krueger cosplayer. So right. we want to put the link of that onto the website for the for the podcast, that sort of thing. And let's find you know, this. You know, pe- people can be then drawn into what uh, what my world uh, is. Um, you know, what my world consists of in terms of um, cosplaying Freddy and what I get up to. I just found it. I just found it. Luckily, when you type in Matt Fittis, yes. uh Freddy, with yeah. a Y, everybody, with a Y, spell it correctly. Yes. Everybody uh, seems to spell it with an I-E. Yeah, no. I did that. I did that. No. <laughs> no. Oh, dear. Uh, I, I can just imagine a whole planet of Freddy fans just going, No! Uh, is that why you, they don't talk to me? That's oh, I get it. I get it's it. It's bad enough when I see people spell Kruger wrong. <laughs> yeah, well, that that has its own origin in in, in the German spelling, so I, I can understand why they get that wrong. The uh, Matt Fittis, the UK Freddy Krueger cosplay page, um, like it. And uh, are there any other um, places where we can find you, Matt? Just that uh, on Facebook. I'm also on Twitter as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can find me on that as well. Um, so that, that, those are mainly the two social um, networking sites that I'm on. So, yeah, you can find me on those. Thanks a lot, Matt, for that. Um, no problem. I'll see you again in the future. Beams. Ah!